I've known Roger McGrath for some 20 years. He's been a longtime historian at UCLA. He's also taught at other California schools. He is an expert among many areas, including the Old West. I thought we'd talk to Roger McGrath about a man named Bass Reeves. Bass Reeves was a deputy U.S. marshal that operated uh, first and for most of his career out of the Western District Court of Fort Smith, Arkansas. And often he would set up camp several miles from the location where he suspected. And then Bass Reeves would dress as uh, some kind of tramp on the road. Most of his arrests came about because of that. And he brought in uh, hundreds and brought him back to be tried before the hanging judge, Isaac Parker. This episode is sponsored by Birch Gold Group. Right now, inflation is at 40-year highs, and looks like it's here to stay because here's the government's dirty little secret. They want it. I mean, think about this. Right now, inflation rates are higher than the interest on Treasury bonds. So with every day that passes, the government owes less on this mountain of debt. I mean, imagine if your mortgage had a negative interest rate. Would you be in much of a hurry to pay it off? Exactly. So your pain is your gain. What to do? Protect your savings now. Hedge against inflation with gold from Birch Gold because the government is literally sabotaging the value of the U.S. dollar. Birch Gold is the only company I trust and recommend for precious metals. They will help you convert an eligible IRA or 401k into an IRA backed by real gold. Now that's peace of mind. With thousands of satisfied customers and an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau, you can trust Birch Gold to help you protect your savings. Go to birchgold.com slash Larry right now to get a no-cost, no-obligation info kit. This comprehensive 20-page guide reveals how gold and silver can protect your savings and how you can buy them under the umbrella of a tax-sheltered account. So do it right now. Go to birchgold.com slash Larry. That's B-I-R-C-H gold.com slash Larry. Bass Reeves is a figure that most people don't know about, or to the extent that they do know about him, know the wrong things. I give you historian Roger McGrath. Roger, tell us who was Bass Reeves. Yeah, thank you, Larry. Uh, Bass Reeves was a deputy U.S. marshal uh, that operated uh, first and for most of his career out of the Western District Court of Fort Smith, Arkansas, uh, with its judge, the famous hanging judge, Isaac Parker. Um, and he did most of his work in what would today be Eastern Oklahoma, in those days, Indian Territory. And that's specifically why he was assigned that area, because uh, during the Civil War, he had uh, left his owner, a uh, Colonel George Reeves, in the Confederate uh, uh, cavalry, who was fighting in Arkansas, the Battle of Pea Ridge and elsewhere. And when he heard about the Emancipation Proclamation, Bass Reeves took off. Not that he had it really bad, I mean, considering slavery, it's an odd thing to say, but his family had been household servants for the Reeves family and the original patriarch, William Reeves. And uh, they had it relatively good. For example, uh, Bass Reeves himself, his, uh, the eldest son kind of took him under his wing. This is George Reeves. And he taught him to shoot firearms, uh, pistols and rifles. And he trained him until he was an expert and Bass Reeves started shooting when he was eight years old, started shooting. I think it's unusual, he was a slave, but yet, and he was taught horsemanship um, and, and all sorts of things. And then he went off as an aide to Colonel George Reeves during the Civil War. But at one point, and we don't know exactly when or under what circumstances, although there's been a lot of stories told about it, but he drifted off. And he drifted off into Indian Territory. And there he spent the last two years of the Civil War before he returned to uh, Texas. Uh, and then eventually uh, bought his own farm in Van Buren, Arkansas. 
And while he was there, since he had lived with the Indians in Indian Territory, when uh, marshals had to go into Indian Territory, they would hire guides who knew the languages there. Uh, and, and for the most part, it was either Muscogean or Iroquoian uh, language. The Cherokee spoke an Iroquoian language and the Choctaw, Chickasaw, Seminole, and Creeks spoke a Muscogean uh, language. And Bass Reeves knew them both. So he hired himself out to these marshals and he would, uh, for years, he, he went out there and aided them, uh, not only guiding them, but interpreting for them. Well, then when this Western District Court had a new judge appointed, this was Isaac Parker, uh, the former judge, the original judge was William Story. He was ineffective and in fact corrupt. Um, and Isaac Parker came in to clean up things. And the first thing he did was hire all these new deputy U.S. Marshals. In fact, he first he hired the chief U.S. Marshal, a guy named James uh, Fagan. And then Fagan hired 200 deputies who would work underneath him. And among these were several black deputies. And although people say, well, the first black deputy west of the Mississippi was Bass Reeves. No, actually there were several, but he became the most prominent and the most successful. Um, so he, he does have that distinction to be sure. Well, uh, Bass Reeves then was a natural for going into Indian territory, which was part of the jurisdiction of this Western District Court. For the first seven years, he was a posseman. And this meant that there was one head deputy U.S. Marshal, and then he would take uh, one, two, three posse men with him on uh, a trek to serve warrants or run down some uh, fugitive in Indian Territory. After seven years, Bass Reeves, again, his apprenticeship as a posse man uh, was so effective, so successful, he demonstrated such uh, leadership and courage that then he took the lead role. And he continued in that lead role for another 25 years, 32 years altogether, 25 years as a lead U.S. Deputy Marshal. And he brought in uh, hundreds, although some people say thousands, but it's not possible. But he did bring in hundreds, uh, had served warrants and arrested hundreds, and brought them back to be tried before the hanging judge, Isaac Parker. And Isaac Parker's reputation was well earned. A few months after he was appointed to that job, uh, he put six convicted men on the scaffold and they were uh, hanged all together at once. It was almost like some festive occasion. Thousands of people had gathered for this hanging. So that established his reputation. And one of the deputies consistently bringing in these men, sometimes for petty things, uh, sometimes for domestic violence, sometimes for horse theft, many times for whiskey running, uh, but sometimes for murder was Bass Reeves. And not only did James Fagan consider him one of his best deputy U.S. Marshals, but so did Isaac Parker. Now, um, you said that he brought in people for a range of offenses, uh, including murder. Uh, I think I read, if not from you somewhere, that uh, these bad guys would go into the Indian Territory because it was lawless, and generally speaking, they're less likely to be captured. That's why they went there. Uh, but upon hearing that Bass Reeves is after you, some of these really bad guys would just throw up their hands and surrender. Is that is that true? Well, not quite throw up their hands and surrender, uh, but they greatly feared him because he was so effective. I mean, they, they would leave notes for each other. Uh, there, there was a warrant for the arrest of, uh, it, it, it may be Jim uh, Webb, it may be Tom Story, um, some other uh, outlaw that was wanted for a capital crime. And they knew that Bass Reeves was on their trail. 
and they'd pin notes to trees, you know, and it was almost, ah, oh, can't catch me. And uh, there was a cat and mouse game that went on. And, and ba uh, Bass Reeves would usually have a cook with him and a posse, a posse man or two. Uh, and often he would set up camp uh, several miles from a location where he suspected uh, the fugitive he was on the trail of um, was located. And then Bass Reeves would uh, dress as uh, some kind of tramp on the road looking for a handout from a farmhouse. Oh, I'll chop wood uh, for breakfast, ma'am, whatever. And uh, so he would, he would adopt this uh, role as uh, some kind of traveler down on his book, sometime, sometimes a drifter, uh, sometimes a criminal on the lam. And most of his arrests came about because of that. He would uh, ingratiate himself with somebody in the neighborhood um, and he would allay their suspicions by virtue of his dress, by virtue of the fact that he knew the Indian languages. I remember much of the time he was dealing with Indians or uh, what they might call biracial today, uh, back then half breeds or something, quarter breeds, half breeds, because his territory was full of Indians. It was uh, full of whites and a good number of blacks as well. And these five civilized tribes, the Seminole, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creeks, and Cherokee owned thousands of black slaves. And the black slaves were not free there until 1866. And you say, wait, there's a 13th Amendment, October of 1865, what's going on here? Well, the Indians said the Constitution doesn't apply to us, doesn't affect our slaves. So the US government had to negotiate separate treaties with each of these tribes to get them to free their black slaves. Well, this meant after 1866, you had thousands of blacks in the, in the area resident in Indian territory. And then of course you had some mixed race of all sorts of white, Indian, black in this, this area. Well, Bass Reeves was one that could, could move easily among all these people. He, he had lived there uh, for the last two years of the Civil War. Uh, and this is how he proved the most effective, where some hot shot, tough, ornery, good shot, white deputy U.S. Marshal couldn't do this. He would stick out like a sore thumb and would be unable to communicate directly uh, with the people that lived among these five civilized tribes there in that area of Indian Territory. Bass Reeves could do it. So a lot of it was not so much upfront confrontation, although sometimes it eventually came to that. But often he would make these arrests. I, I give you one typical example that he wound up uh, getting fed breakfast. And there's typical on the frontier everywhere. Cattle ranches, farms, anything. You were tramping on the road and you came up and and asked for breakfast and, and they invite you. It was just an American tradition. Feed you breakfast. And then usually it was your duty to go out and chop some wood or do something before you moved on down the road. Well, at this location where he thought the mother was uh, hiding her two sons who were on the lam, warrants were out for them, uh, he came up to this house and the mother cooked him breakfast and he was able to ingratiate himself with her because of his manner, his, his uh, tattered clothes and uh, his familiarity with all the local customs, everything. Well, then when she relaxed, completely at, uh, relaxed, she stepped out into the yard in front of the cabin and let out a low whistle. And some low whistles came back in reply. In other words, it was safe now. Come on home, boys. And these two outlaws came in, sat down with Bass Reeves, and uh, chatted it up like old friends. And Bass Reeves slowly let on that he was on the lam also. And they had no reason to disbelieve him because he fit in so perfectly. Well, that night, 
when they all went to sleep and the two outlaw sons and Bass Reeves together on cots and in one room in the cabin and these two outlaws went sound asleep snoring Bass Reeves <laughs> quietly got up handcuffed them both <laughs> and uh, early in the morning left uh, with them and he was uh, marching back to the, his camp which was seven miles away and the mother marched right behind him cussing up a blue streak all the way <laughs> was he ever was he ever shot at was he ever hit oh. <laughs> yeah bat bass reeves uh, shot at plenty of times and i mentioned earlier jim webb and this was i, I think bass reeves best a uh, gunfight uh he had tracked down jim webb and there's a long story behind this but uh and they started shooting each other from some distance, uh, perhaps half a football field, 50 yards or, or more, uh, maybe even 100 yards. And uh, Jim Webb's shots narrowly missed killing Bass Reeves. One bullet went through Bass Reeves' hat. Another uh, bullet took off part of his collar. Another bullet knocked a button off his coat and uh yeah yeah and and so forth he, he was almost riddled with bullets but they didn't strike him they strike uh something on his body or some accoutrement that was there and uh two of bass reeves shots caught uh caught jim webb and uh jim webb was mortally wounded but before he died, he said, and they'd been, they'd been um, kind of adversaries for a couple of years. Jim Reed had been arrested by Bass Reeves, and then um, Jim Webb jumped his bail. So this has been going on for a couple of years. Uh, but Jim Webb harbored no ill feelings. It was like a just an honorable shootout among worthy opponents. And and he told Bass Reeves, he said, yeah, I, I thought I was going to get you, but I got to admit, you took me out, you know. <laughs> and he died. <laughs> Roger, um, when Quentin Tarantino made Django, I heard him say, I made this film because I wanted to give black people uh, a hero from that era. And it just drove me nuts because there were lots of black heroes of that era, one of whom is the man we're talking about, Bass Reeves. Why is it that there hasn't been a real movie, a serious movie about this man? Yeah, I mean, I was, I was thinking about this when, when you talked about during this interview that perhaps a problem now, today especially, a modern day uh, Bass Reeves may be somebody like Milwaukee County Sheriff or former Sheriff David Clark. <laughs> so I'm not sure if uh, all the cultural Marxist, politically correct, Black Lives Matter, all those kind of things, um, think very highly of David Clark. But that was a Bass Reeves type of guy. Bass Reeves was absolutely law and order. He was absolutely upright, honest, uh, and he had an outstanding reputation among whites and, and blacks equally. Uh, he was also a family man. He, he stayed married to his first wife until, until she died, and then he, um, he later remarried. And to show you how I felt about Law and Order, his, his son, in a rage over a suspected infidelity by his wife, the son, Benny, shot his wife to death. Well, it was Bass Reeves who went out and arrested his own son, brought him back, and his son was tried, convicted, and sentenced to life in prison. As, as it turned out, uh, the son, Benny, spent... Uh, a little over 11 years 
at Fort Leavenworth, and then his sentence was commuted. But that was after Bass Reeves died. But the fact is, his own son, he was a real law and order figure. And whereas years ago, it would have been an absolutely, I think, hot topic for Hollywood to have done a, a, Bass, a Bass Reeves uh, movie. Today, I'm not sure. I'm not sure where they would go with that. Because uh, here's somebody that, and again and again, he said things. There's quotes from him about, uh, there'd be, I think one time, and I, I don't know, it may be apocryphal, but he, he was asked something about enforcing white man's law here, you know, because this was among Indians and blacks and whites. And he said, the law is the law. And he said, uh, it uh, may have been and it may still be imperfect, but without it, we have nothing. Wow. So I'm not sure things like that be popular now, today now, among kind of that crowd. Now, Roger, you have written that the temptation is to assume that people don't know about Bass Reeves because he's black. But you point out that they don't know about another, a number of contemporaries of Bass Reeves who are white. Explain. Uh, this area did not, uh, it got local press, but it did not get national press. Uh, for, for example, I, I found that the greatest examples of shootouts, you know, in the main street or something, which we think of as kind of the Hollywood shootout, were in the mining camps of the Old West, not in the cow towns of Kansas. Um, and so people part, point to the cow towns of Kansas. And as, as you said, well, they didn't have these Hollywood shootouts there as portrayed. Uh, Jim Arness, you know, Gunsmoke or something. Um, and, and that was the case of the Kansas cow towns, but that's what America knew. They, they didn't know about Austin, Nevada. They didn't know about Bodie, California. They didn't know about Aurora, Nevada. They didn't know about all these gold and silver camps of Nevada and California and Idaho that that was the real action was in the mining camps of the old west the nation did not know about it the nation knew about the cattle towns of kansas abilene and ellsworth and caldwell and wichita and dodge city and so that was their image of the west those are the lawmen they know about and uh those are the gunfights or the shootouts that they know about and it misses huge chunks, but that became the legends of the West. You know, I, I think it's unfortunate because a, a lot of heroic law figures that uh, did not have a connection to that part of the Old West, right. the cattle towns, are unknown. I mean, I, I can name gunfighters, nobody, I mean, scholars, anybody, for example, one that I've written about, uh, John Daly, one of the most feared gunfighters who's ever lived in America. Uh, but he was on the mining frontiers of the far west. Nobody's ever heard of him. And all the ones you think about, you've heard of, that have all this fame and press, but John Daly, perfectly white, <laughs> you know, but nobody's ever heard of him. And the lawmen uh, and others that, uh, got into confrontations with him. Nobody ever has ever heard of them also. So part of it's because of that theme and much of the fame, because you have guys that were involved with those cattle towns that later became prominent writers. Bat Masterson. Bat Masterson was right there where all this was happening. All these guys in the cattle towns were his buddies. And then he went to New York City and became a journalist. And he wrote about all this. So that captured the nation's imagination. That set all the, the template for the shootouts and everything else. And much of that from Bat Masterson. But there were other authors because the railroads could take them out to these places. They didn't have to ride a stagecoach for 500 miles to some mining camp in uh, northeastern Nevada. They took the railroad out there, got off, and here they were, right there in the Old West, ready to watch the action. 
And they wrote about it and sent, you know, uh, their stories to newspapers in the East. And I think that is uh, the, the principal reason why you get disproportionate amount of focus on one particular set of lawmen and gun uh, and gunfighters. And, and, and Roger, you point out uh, that uh, Bass Reeves was, illiter was illiterate, couldn't read or couldn't write, so therefore didn't write about his own exploits, and nobody else wrote about them. Well, in local newspapers, you can find quite a bit about Bass Reeves, though. But again, they were local papers. They, they were papers in Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Texas. And they didn't get that national attention. Right. He was interviewed. I mean, there were stories about him. So he, he was not ignored. He got ink locally, but it didn't go nas uh, nationally. And uh, yes, we don't have an autobiography. Uh, we don't have memoirs. We don't have a paper trail. This is this is also a problem because many of the things people write today about Bass Reeves are absolutely undocumented. And they were the grandchildren, not the children, but the grandchildren of people who knew Bass Reeves. And they were stories that were handed down. We have to go back carefully and try to uh, fit that into what we do know, the historical record. And much of, much of what's been written, unfortunately, about Bass Reeves now, comes from that undocumented kind of third generation oral history. Mm -hmm. A couple more questions, Roger. Uh, how did he die? Well, he had Bright's disease, uh, nephritis, <clears throat> kidney disease. And by the way, coincidentally, Isaac Parker also died of Bright's disease. Bass Reeves, um, tall, uh, lanky, robust guy, in great physical condition most of his life. But uh, he, was, he was about 6'2 and 180 pounds, tall, lean, lanky, um, and had uh, a great tendon strength. He wasn't a thick, heavy guy at all, but he had great uh, strength. It was a real sad demise for him because his last several years, he, uh, he, he failing kidneys, he, he shriveled up, had real health problems, and then died in 1910. He was 71 years old, mm -hmm. been born in 18, uh, 1838, right. died in 1910, uh, was about halfway through, halfway to 72 when he died. And uh, at the time, he had been, a, uh, until his health failed, been a, uh, just a beat cop, a city cop in Muskogee, uh, because his career as a federal deputy U.S. marshal was over. And he, um, he decided to become, it sounds like a big step downward, but he took a job as simply a walk to beat as a cop in Muskogee, Oklahoma. Roger, there is this narrative, uh, I think it's a myth, that Bass Reeves was the inspiration for the Lone Ranger. Can you clarify that? Yeah, you know, unfortunately, with uh, now Bass Reeves becoming more familiar uh, to the general public, as and deservedly so, but along with that, it's become all sorts of misinformation um, and uh, uh, fiction that comes out of some writer's imagination. And you will see on, on many sites, uh, repeated, but they all go back to the same source, that the Lone Ranger was really based on Bass Reeves. And the only reason we didn't know that from 1932 on, when the program first aired on a radio station in Detroit, uh, because of racism. Well, <laughs> actually, we have all the program development notes from that radio station, from the owner of the station, from the program manager of the station, and from the writer himself, Francis Stryker, Fran Stryker. Um, and all of them start with, all right, well, let's, let's take a, a figure, oh, somebody maybe Robin Hood or 
Oh, wait, Zorro. There we go, Zorro. He has the mask and this and that. And you can see it step by step developing the Lone Ranger. Now, neither the station owner, nor the program uh, manager, nor the writer knew anything about Bass Reeves. Never heard about Bass Reeves. But <laughs> they knew Robin Hood, they knew Zorro, and they knew the Texas Rangers. And so they created this Zorro-like character. Well, there was one author about 20 years ago that said, well, uh, yes, there's uh, a high likelihood that he, he was the basis for the Lone Ranger because one time he paid for breakfast uh, for himself and uh, his posse men with a silver dollar. And that became the silver bullet. <laughs> it, oh, well, that, that's conclusive. I mean, but silver dollars, that's what people use for coins then. And that was commonly used. And that's a long ways from the silver mine and the silver bullet of the Lone Ranger. Okay. And then another time I said, well, he possibly could have ridden a white horse. Well, he rode dozens and dozens of horses over his career. And his favorite regular horse was a sorrel. And the only reference to any horse that gets close to white was one time he was seen riding out of town on a gray horse. Well, we know gray horses later, in years later, they become white horses. But, uh, and, and then he also said, well, look, uh, occasionally Bass Reeves would take an Indian guide with him. Well, occasionally he did, most of the time he did not but occasionally did, but more of the time, far more of the time, all the white U.S. deputy marshals took Indian guides with them because those whites usually did not speak the Indian languages. Um, and, uh, well, there was a couple others, disguises. <laughs> well, again, this was common to all lawmen in the Old West. They would often, and the Pinkertons, think about the Pinkertons. Um, and then you think about that one Pinkerton detective that came up a, as a tramp to the uh, James boy's mother's farm, the Samuel farm in Missouri. You know what happened to him. But it was common for Pinkerton detectives, for lawmen, everybody to go about in disguises to try to uh, infiltrate some of the uh, home areas and, and safe houses of outlaws. So again, that was nothing unique with Bass Reeves. It was, and he had learned it as a posse man under white U.S. deputy uh, marshals, the use of disguises to try to fit into the uh, local populace. Finally, Roger, there is a movie on Netflix called The Harder They Fall. There's a character in there named Bass Reeves. I asked you to watch the movie. I watched maybe 20 minutes of it. I couldn't take it anymore. It was kind of a hip hop Western. I'm not sure what the, what the devil it was, but I asked you to watch it. And uh, <laughs> uh, to, to your, <laughs> uh, to your uh, credit, you watched the entire film. What did you think of the film? What did you think of the character called Bass Reeves? Was the character at all historically accurate? Well, in, in one sense, it, it was historically accurate, and that's this sense, that he's portrayed as a tall, formidable, courageous, honorary guy. <laughs> okay, but that's it. The, the rest of it's just all pure fantasy. Uh, they have Bass Reeves in the movie, cooperating with an outlaw gang and uh, being part of part of their criminal operations. It's, it's, it's really the whole movie is kind of a revenge flick, but uh, Bass Reeves becomes part of that. Well, that was quite the opposite of what he was. 
Bass Reeves was an absolute straight arrow guy. Um, he he never <laughs> would have uh, participated in any of those kinds of activities. Um, yeah, the movie it, itself, it's, um, I thought at first it was going to be a black spaghetti western. But then it had tongue-in-cheek, it had spoofs, it had some of the most incredibly gruesome scenes I've ever seen in a movie, like a horror film. Um, it was it was disjointed, uh, at times absolutely bizarre. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know what to make of it. <laughs> there were some funny bits in it. Um, I, but it's almost impossible to categorize. They used the names of real historical figures for their characters. But there's a problem then. Remember, this we're all blacks in the movie. I mean, occasionally there were some whites, that, but uh, just with insignificance. And... One of the gang leaders, big bad gang leaders, was Rufus Buck, who was an actual historical figure. The problem was Rufus Buck was a Creek Indian. He was not black. And this goes for a lot of the other characters they name in there, with a prominent exception like Bill Pickett, who was black. But he wasn't an outlaw. He, he was a, a cowboy and a bulldogger, you know. Um, so they mix and match all sorts of things in the movie. And I guess you have to say, if some somebody in, enjoys it, they sell some tickets, God bless them. Well, well, Roger, maybe someday, you know, as you know, I, I am a filmmaker. The My documentary, Uncle Tom, uh, made more money than all, all five of the documentaries that were nominated for Best Documentary last year combined. We have the second one coming out in a couple of months. Um, you are a noted historian. Maybe you and I can team up someday and do a real film about Bass Reeves. Yeah, wouldn't that be neat? I mean, it would be, be great just to tell a straight story. Right. Um, and, we and, don't, and we don't need to make anything was, up. My goodness. It's got to be box office. And by the <laughs> way, your documentary, I think, was rated a point and a half or two points higher than the higher they uh, the Harder They Fall movie is rated on IMDb. Right. <laughs> well, Roger, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you for your expertise. And, and maybe someday we'll get together and make that movie. <laughs> there we go, Larry. Thank All you. Right. God bless. Mm -hmm.